chapter 20. Tonight we're talking about distractions, disruptions, and destination. Destinations. How many of you know you have a destination? We all have a destination from God. Now, of course, we're not talking about our final destination, which is heaven. That's our final destination. But we have a destination in the meantime. Things we're to do. People we're to see. Places we're to go. We have a destination, which means we have a purpose, which means we're not just wandering about like a pinball, running into a, this wall and then running into that one and bouncing off this one. We have a path to walk. This is the way, walk ye in it, God says. We have a purpose in that walk. And here, the Apostle Paul, in Acts chapter 20, he talks about it a little bit. And I'm going to look at first, um, verse 16. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. He hastened, if possible, to be in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. He knew he had to get to Jerusalem. He had it in his heart. He had it by the Spirit to get to Jerusalem by Pentecost. But look at verse 22. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit. This is how strongly he knew. He was bound in the Spirit, he says, unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Obviously, he had this understanding that it was not all going to be good. Except the Holy Spirit has witnessed in every city saying that bonds and afflictions are waiting for me. Bonds and afflictions. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my, my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He is saying that all of the warnings that people are giving him all of the people, the prophets, are coming and saying, there's going to be bonds and afflictions for you in Jerusalem. Turn aside. Go another way. Yet he knows this is his course. And he will not allow anything to disrupt his course. You see, Abraham's course was disrupted. What we are witnessing in the Middle East today is because his course was disrupted. God said to Abram while he was in uh, Mesopotamia, I want you to leave in Genesis 12, leave your family, leave your friends, leave your country, and go to a land where I will show you. I'm giving you this land, and, I, and you're going to have a nation, and I'll bless them to bless you and curse them that curses you. And Abram believed God and left and came into the land of Canaan. And God said, this is the land. What did he see in the land of Canaan? But famine. There was famine. Famine disrupted his course. Famine disrupted his call. Rather than remain in the land in famine, he went to Egypt. And what happened in Egypt? He got a maidservant for his wife, Hagar. And what happened with her? She became the mother of Ishmael. And what happened to Ishmael? The nation of Arabs came from Ishmael. And so today, we have this conflict which began way back then because his course was disrupted. Now, one thing I want to mention, that when God spoke to Abraham and said, Abraham, it's Genesis, I believe, 17, I want you to take your son. Remember? He wanted him to take Isaac to Mount Moriah. He said the following, I want you to take your son, your only son. Ishmael was alive at the time. Ishmael was older than Isaac. God said to Abram, he only had one son in his eyes. And that was Isaac. And the nation of Israel came through Isaac. Now, that does not mean he did not love Ishmael. And God loves the Arab people. I have wonderful Arab friends who are Muslim. They haven't converted to the, to the Lord yet. And I have friends that are believers that are Arab. And God loves them. But they have been deceived. 
and I believe that Islam is demonic and they're deceived and that's why they have such a hatred for the truth because Satan has a hatred for the truth and all that's good here Paul said I'm going to go though there's a disruption now David had it had it he didn't have a disruption David was loved of God and called of God he had a distraction which nearly cost him everything that distraction was Bathsheba Bathsheba rather than being out with the army where he should have been as the leader he was back in his palace walking the walls and looks down and he sees a beautiful woman bathing and rather than keep on walking or look away he became captivated by her and he continued to watch and you know the story he called for her he slept with her even though he knew that she was married then he realized when she was pregnant that he needed to cover it up so he called for the husband to come back from the battlefield thinking he'd go home to his wife but he was more honorable than the king and he said how can I sleep in my bed with my wife while the rest of my comrades are in the field at battle I'm going to sleep outside the gate on the ground and so that didn't work so David went to plan B and he had her husband assassinated he told the leaders of the army put him in the front where the battle is the fiercest and then everybody back away withdraw and let him be by himself and he was killed and what happened the child that he conceived died and a pestilence came upon the land until he repented and asked God's forgiveness that distraction cost him distractions will cost us if they get us off of the path of God this last 14 months has been a major distraction this COVID has been and continues to be a distraction right now for those of you up in the DC area may not be aware of it but here in Myrtle Beach specifically there's a distraction called gas gasoline the uh, the pipeline that was tampered with by hackers has cut off the gasoline to our community but that's not the big problem the big problem is everybody's reaction to it the big problem is everybody panicking and whether they need gas or not they get in line to get gas they may have three quarters of a tank but they got to go fill it up and so the gas stations are overwhelmed and this morning for well yesterday I saw lines people getting gas you know, here, here's they're so they're in such a panic they're not even paying attention because I, I came to a, a gas station it was uh, it was right right over here the Kroger supermarket that had gas and pumps and there's a line out the street in both directions coming in the parking lot to go to the gas station and this and their lines are like 20 cars in line they're all going to one pump well there's like 12 pumps so I come into the parking lot just to check it out and there's nobody at the other pumps so I just pull up to a pump and get gas they're so in such a panic they're not thinking and that's what distraction does it keeps us from thinking and pursuing the plan of God the things of God the enemy wants to distract us and get us in a panic so we can no longer trust God or walk in the spirit this morning I was out at about 7 a.m. and I saw tanker trucks because the the pipeline got fixed yesterday tanker trucks all over the place delivering gas I saw one gas station two tanker trucks two gigantic trucks delivering gas I saw people getting gas all over up here around the church people there's at least three or four stations here people getting gas no lines people getting gas by this afternoon because of the panic every every gas station was empty and nobody could get gas now we go through a summer here where 14 million people come through 14 million people and we never run out of gas because everybody is normal and not in a panic and this is what panic does it, it's the same thing how many of you remember 14 months ago you couldn't find toilet paper same panic people were hoarding it I understand Pastor Mary Beth told me that they put out public notice not to put gasoline in plastic bags and keep it in the trunk of your car duh 
Who would think of that? That's why they have gasoline containers that you put gas into and keep them in there. But this is the kind of, this is what panic does. Pa people just freak out and do things that are just not, they're nonsensical. So here, the Apostle Paul, he is, he is telling them that I know there's some trouble up ahead, but I have a destination. And I'm not going to let the enemy derail me by distracting me or disrupting me. Look at this also in Acts 26. Go to Acts 26. This is after he's in Jerusalem and he's arrested. In Acts 26, he is speaking to uh, the king, King Agrippa, and he says this, verse 16. The Lord said to him when he met him on the, on the uh, road to Damascus, Rise, stand upon your feet, for I have appeared unto you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of these things which you have seen, and of those things for the which I will appear unto you. Delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send you, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. This means he, the Apostle Paul is saying, no matter what distraction the enemy put before me, no matter how my trip or my course was disrupted, I was not disobedient to the vision. I held on to the vision. I knew the goal. I knew the destination. I continued toward it. I may have been sidetracked, but I got back on track. We can't let COVID sidetrack us from winning souls. We can't let the lack of gas sidetrack us from being in service. We can't let anything that the enemy does because he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy our goal, our call, our destination, which is our destiny. Each of us has a destiny. Each of us has a God-given destiny. I want to read some different scriptures rather than have you turn. I, have, I decided to isolate them and hit, write, write them down. Jeremiah 29, 11, I quote a lot. But listen to this last part of it. I know the thoughts I have toward you, thoughts of good and not of evil, to bring you to an expected end. That's a destiny. An expected end. A destiny. I know the thoughts I have to you, toward you. Thoughts of good and not evil because I have a destiny for you. I have a destination for you. I have something for you to do, every one of us. And this is not just our jobs, raising our families. This is for the kingdom of God. Every one of us has a destiny in the kingdom of God. That's why we're here. Otherwise, he would have raptured us out of here the moment we got saved. I know the thoughts I have toward you, thoughts of good and not of evil, to bring you to an expected end. So he says, the Apostle Paul says, I'm not disobedient to the heavenly vision. What does he write later? Shipwrecked three times, a night and a day on the sea. He was, uh, he was betrayed of brothers. He was betrayed by others. He was beaten three times. He was imprisoned. He, we hear about the one time when he was imprisoned with Silas, beaten for no good reason, imprisoned illegally because he was a Roman citizen. Over and over and over, the enemy tries to disrupt his mission, tries to distract him from his mission. Now today, you and I may not be being beaten. You and I may not be being shipwrecked. We may not be disrupted in that way. But we are bombarded every day by worldly news. We are bombarded every day by social media. We are bombarded every day by our culture, the culture of the world, the culture of our nation and our country. We are bombarded every day with things to distract us from what's really important, distract us from what really produces, distract us from our mission. Our mission 
to win the lost. As a church, to win the lost. Equip the saints, touch the nations. We're equipping the saints at every service and many days of the week online. We're equipping the saints of God. We're touching the nations through our missions. Winning the lost is one of all of our goals. How do we do that? It's so easy today to get somebody to come online with us. To have them come online. Invite them to your home to come online with you if you're not physically in church. Invite them to come online. Encourage them to come online. They don't have to leave their own homes and be in an anointed service to share your faith with somebody. It is not a... Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Optional. It's not optional to share our faith. It is our obligation to share our faith, to freely give what we have freely received. And it's easy to tell people about Jesus. It is easy to tell them what God has done for us. There are so many times that the enemy has tried to disrupt and distract. Jesus talked about that, by the way. Um, he said something like this in Mark 4, 19, that after the seed was sown, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entered in and choked the word and it became unfruitful. That's a major distraction. The cares of this world how many, how many, now we're caring for Israel because God's word tells us to. But how many other cares do we have put upon us that they're broadcast to us? And we start to care about this and care about that. And they are really worldly things that will pass away. That's part of the reason I've, I've tried to wean my, and I've been pretty successful, to wean myself from a lot of politics and a lot of news because I'd be up here preaching politics because I get so outraged and and I want to focus I don't want to be distracted by that you know the politicians they're gonna pass away the politics are gonna pass away the parties are gonna pass away all of that's gonna pass away all of these movements are gonna pass away all of these these, and I'm talking about the racial movements and the other movements, they're all going to pass away. Because God is not racially oriented. The Word of God is not racially oriented. He sees all of us the same and says there's neither Jew nor Greek, but we are one in Christ. These are all going to pass away. But what's going to remain is the Word of God will never pass away. We have a mission to bring the unchanging Word of God to the people around us on a daily basis. The Apostle Paul states, I was not disobedient to that heavenly vision. Psalm 73, verse 2 and 3 says this, But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He was distracted when he saw the prosperity of the wicked. Distracted. That, if we are looking at other people, we will be distracted. I, I haven't told this story for a long time, but I'm going to tell it because it fits in right now. When I was in high school, I ran track. I was not particularly fast. You know, when, you know, when, when you were in high school, I mean, I don't think anybody, anybody here run track anymore. Anybody run a 100-yard dash anymore? No. We're all past that. But when we were in high school... You knew the guys or the girls that were fast. They were, we used to call them burners. They could burn, but they couldn't last long, so they ran the sprints. Anyway, I used to run the 220-yard dash, the 200 meters. And I was not particularly fast, but I learned that I could overtrain, that I could train instead of 220 meters, I could train for 250 or 280 meters, which gave me extra stamina so that even though I was not as fast as fast runners, if I ran as fast as I could from the very first moment to the very last moment, I could beat them. And that was working for me. 
and I was winning. I started out not winning. I started out, but then I moved up and I started winning. So I was in the uh, state finals, and they one team put in a kid that I knew, and I knew he was a burner. I knew he was really, really fast, and he never ran against me and never ran in my race. He used to run the 100 because he was so fast, but they put him into the 220. And I made a calculation. I made a huge error. For some reason, that threw me off. Seeing him in my race threw me off. And rather than run my race, somehow I got stupid. I mean, extremely stupid. And I thought, all I need to do is keep up with him. So I came out of the starting blocks, and rather than burning right out of the blocks, I eased back. You know, I went back into third gear. And I'm cruising along with him. He's right next to me. I don't know what I was thinking, because we came out of that turn, and he burned. I, didn't, I wasn't that fast. There was no way. I, I came in fourth. I didn't even get a medal. I blew it. Why? I was running somebody else's race. And that's exactly what one of the things the enemy wants to distract us with by looking at somebody else and wanting to be them, wanting to be like them, wanting to do what they do, wanting to say what they say, wanting to walk like them, talk like them, have what they have. And that is called coveting another person's goods. That's distracting. And it distracts us from being who we are called to be. Because if God wanted us to be them, he wouldn't need us. He'd just use them to do what he wants to do. He wants us to be us. And he's called each one of us in a unique way, with a unique call. And he's counting on all of us together to get the job done. Nobody is excluded. Everybody is needed. Everybody is anointed. Everybody has a destiny, a call. I have another scripture for you, and it's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 35, and in this particular translation, you'll like it. This I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction, without distraction. There's so much that tries to get our attention. If something worldly grabs our attention, we're distracted. Let's talk about a couple of ladies, Mary and Martha. They had no idea what was in their future when Jesus came to have dinner with them. They had no idea what, how God was going to use them. But there they are at dinner, Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to the word. Martha... She is flustered. There's so much to do. So many people. So much to cook. So much to serve. So much to do. And she is so busy getting it all right, getting it all done. And she, every time she passes by that room, she sees Mary sitting there doing nothing. Finally, she's had enough. She is so encumbered and so distracted by all the details of life. She looks at Jesus and says, don't you care? that my sister's doing nothing, and I'm doing it all? And Jesus had a most surprising reaction. He said, Mary, uh, Martha, Martha, you're so encumbered by all the details of life. In other words, you're so distracted by making everything right, controlling everything, trying to keep it all just how you want it, and you've neglected the most important thing. Mary is listening to the word, feeding on the word, being built up by the word. That's our first and foremost goal, to be feeding and built up by the word of God. Because when crunch time comes, we need the word of God as a weapon, the sword of the spirit. We need the word of God as a backup. We need the word of God as a cushion. We need the word of God as a support. And we need the word of God to batter down the enemy in prayer. There are so many times when distractions come. When Paul talks about being shipwrecked, imagine that. That's just amazing. 
What distractions are in our lives today? Okay, I've mentioned a couple of major ones for you down here, the gas thing, COVID. That's for everybody, for all of us. Those are major distractions. But I'm sure if we are easily distracted, and this is what I think, I, I have a theory. The more easily distracted we are, the more distractions we'll have. Because the enemy knows it's just like that. He can get us off, get us distracted. When we are distracted, we're looking at something else. You know, there are times when I'm driving, Pastor Mary Beth's sitting next to me, we're driving, and she says, oh, look at that. And I look at that, and then I hear her say, stay on the road. And I'm like, you told me to look at that. It's always her fault. You told me to look at that. And she said, I said, look at it. I said, drive at it. But, you know, what, we're, what we, we tend to look at, that's the way we tend to go. How does it turn out to be my fault? Yeah, what we focus on, turn her mic off, Ken. What we focus on, <laughs> what we focus on is where we go. That's our destination. So if we are focusing on the things of this world, that is our destination. If we're focusing on the things of God, that is our destination. Now, it doesn't mean that that's, you know, the things of the world is God's destination for us. No, that's what we determine by the way we're steering. So number one is what we're looking, where we're, where, where our focus, where we're focused on. If we're focused on the world, we're going to be steering to the world. If we're focused on God, we're going to be steering to God, things of God. And then we know from God's word, James tells us that our tongue is the rudder. What we are saying will determine where we're going. What we are saying will determine where we're going. If we constantly say, I could never win souls. I could, ne I could never share my, I, could, I just don't know. I'm just too embarrassed. I just, I just can't do it. Then you know what? You can't. But if we begin to say, I can do all things through Jesus Christ. Lord, send somebody across my path. Lord, give me an open door. Lord, soften somebody's heart. Speak to me and show me. You start talking like that, you are going to be sharing your faith every single day. Smith Wigglesworth, one of the favorite ones I like to tell stories about, was never ashamed. He was at a pastor's, preaching for a pastor one time, and the pastor took him out to lunch at the fanciest restaurant in the city. Fanciest restaurant, most expensive. And they sit down, and they, were, they got a table right in the middle of the, of the restaurant, surrounded by the high society of that city all over the place on Sunday afternoon. And all of a sudden, Smith Wigglesworth starts, he takes a spoon, he starts hitting his glass. Ding, 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 until everybody gets quiet. You know, when somebody does that in a restaurant, everybody starts to get quiet. And Smith Wigglesworth stands up and he says, I could not help but notice that all of you people eat like hogs. The pastor sliding down in his seat, trying to be unseen at the moment because these are all the leading people of the city. And he, Smith Wigglesworth continues and says, because only hogs would eat their food without praying first. And then he sat down. The pastor's mortified, in shock, but became overwhelmed by even greater shock when one of the wealthiest industrialists that lived in that city came over to Smith Wigglesworth and said, Sir, I must apologize for my behavior. Can you pray for me? And shortly thereafter, the industrialist and his family knelt down at the side of the table and received Jesus, born again. Can we do that? Now, I don't mean just for any random reason, go in and tell people they ate like hogs, okay? That was Smith Wigglesworth. He did stuff like that. That may not be your destiny. Your destiny may be a little softer, a little kinder, a little gentler, but with the same result. Same result. Can we share our faith? Can we seek the kingdom first? We are all so consumed by our own stuff. If we are all consumed by our own stuff, who's going to take care of God's stuff? 
the kingdom of God. Seek the kingdom first and everything else will be added. Can you use your emails for Christ? Can you use your texts for Christ? Can you use your phones for Christ? Can you use your web pages, your, your, your uh, uh, what is it called, Facebook for Christ? Can you use your Instagram for Christ? Can you use all of these things for Jesus? The answer is yes. Because the devil's certainly using them for his kingdom. Why don't we turn the tables on the enemy? Mm -hmm.